Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and a very warm welcome to the new Sam Martin Burr Show. My name's Sam and I believe that you can access Arabic texts from day one. I do not believe in hiding the most beautiful part of the Arabic language, be it the Quran, be it poetry, be it other beautiful Arabic texts, behind a wall of years of laborious grammar and tons of vocab lists. In this new show, I'm going to be answering your questions for free, and I will be also delivering other um, Arabic text walkthroughs as well for free, providing you with a framework to access um, some of these most iconic and beautiful Arabic texts, um, and not hiding them, as I mentioned before. So in this very first episode, I'm going to answer a very broad question. This question is, how do I learn Arabic? And I thought it would be nice for us to answer this question first and foremost, because the more broad the question is, the more common it is. And the more broad the question it is, the more broad the answer can be as well. So I think we'll actually encompass uh, a lot of what a lot of students really want. So there's about nine different things that I think I need to mention. I sat down for a little while when, um, when I saw this question and, uh, and I thought it would be a good idea to use it as our first episode of this podcast and of this show because, um, frankly, it's just so broad. Really, like, there are other kind of interpretations and other kind of angles off of this question, but in essence, all of you are asking this. In essence, every single student at one point in their life either did or are asking this very question. So I put together about nine different things that you need to bear in mind if you want to learn Arabic. So if, when a student comes to me and they say that, the first thing that I think that you need to do is you need to decide what for. Arabic is pretty big and the world of Arabic resources is pretty big as well. And they're written for different approaches to Arabic. They're written for people with very different goals. So you need to know what you're learning Arabic for, right? There's such a variety of Arabic language resources that um, you need to spend a little bit of time in the beginning being clear on what you want. Because sometimes when people come into the world of wanting to learn Arabic, they think it's similar to French. If you want to learn French, there are dialects in French, of course, and different accents and stuff, but pretty much all French works for all French. P pretty much, right? Like, okay, like, some of the scholars among you will say, yeah, like modern French, you can't access that classical French. I don't really mean that, okay? I mean, even like now and like for the most part, Arabic's not really like that. You could go to an Arabic teacher and you could learn Egyptian dialect for chatting in a cafe and you could do a long time on that. And then you could have zero understanding of a poem from 400 years ago. You could quite easily do that and vice versa. You could quite easily spend years with your, your head in the Arab classical Arabic grammar books and learning to understand the speech of Allah in the Quran and then have zero competency in, um, you know, in a coffee shop in Libya, right? Like that, that is very, very possible. So you need to know what you're learning for. And there are a few different categories maybe I can give you to break it down into. One of them, modern dialects. Of those, what dialects? There are ones which, will, which you can group pretty much. I think you can pretty well group share me dialect. I think if you learn from a Syrian, you'll be quite competent speaking to someone who's Lebanese. If you speak, if you have a teacher who's Lebanese, you'll be quite competent speaking to a Palestinian right? The next dialect I'd consider one of its own is Egyptian. Not because it's so unintelligible from others, but because it's so popular um, and so distinct, right? Like it's, it's got certain characteristics about its pronunciation that make it, um, you can spot it a mile off. You can spot an Egyptian speaker a mile off. Other North African dialects like Tunisia onwards, that kind of mix with French and Amaziri and stuff, um, those kind of need to be done on a on a place by place basis. So like, there are some some ways you can group some of those modern dialects, but I'd put that as like one box on its own. If that's what you want, you need to focus on that, and that's the thing you want it for. Whether it be for a partner, whether it be for communicating with people at work or whatever, right? The next thing is if you're someone who purely wants to learn from the Quran. Some people they just want to learn for their Islamic studies. They have no interest in sitting in a shisha cafe in in Cairo and chatting to the waiter. Many people have no interest in that, okay? You don't need dialects. You don't need to learn Amiya. So you should get clear on what you want and why. And you should have goals in that, right? Like your goal, you should have goals about what you actually want to use your Arabic for and get clearer on that. That's the first thing which will narrow down your focus and make your goals so much quicker to achieve, right? Like the, that will cut off like hours of your travel time of getting to your destination, figuratively speaking, for learning the Arabic language. The next thing will be about setting realistic expectations. A lot of the time, students think, OK, I want to learn Arabic, but they don't really know what it looks like to have learned a bit of Arabic, what it, learned, what it looks like to have learned a bit of Arabic and now be practicing it. 
and what it looks like to having to be having to revise the Arabic that you learned a month ago and put it on paper and what it will feel like to actually start opening your mouth and say to somebody, Subah al Khair, Hel Tatakalamu Inglesia. Like, what will it feel like to actually say those words to people in the streets? And what will it feel like when people look at you funny because you're speaking Fusha to them? And, you know, and they say things like, <laughs> when they say things back to you like that. What will it feel like to have those interactions? And, you know, we, we, we have a lot of ignorance in that in-between stage of going from, like, I want to learn Arabic and I know nothing, to, like, being fluent. And a big fault of that is us as the Arabic teachers, because... And all languages teachers, right, like all YouTube linguists of any kind, right, we're, we're to blame for this because we were only showing who we are as the finished piece, right? Like, I didn't have a YouTube channel, I wasn't making videos when I was in my second year of my Arabic degree and I was making eight mistakes a line when I was submitting my first essays. You guys didn't see that, unfortunately. I, I wish you did. Like, I, I really, I really, like, it would have been, it would have been fantastic if I'd, if I'd known about YouTube and I was interested in it at that stage of my life, right, to be able to document that. And creating the series on my YouTube channel, My Bangla Diary, of me learning Bangla was, was to give you guys a bit of a glimpse of that, right? Although that's not, an especial, that's not a very long series and it was just something really for me to learn the Bangla script. Um, you know, that, that's more the kind of thing that I think um, linguists should be putting out into the world. So we should have realistic expectations and, and we should be aware that it'll have challenges. And think to yourself at the beginning, what will you do when things get difficult? Like, are you a person who actually has to deal with anything difficult in your life? Like, I'm sure you are, because all, like, all humans have difficulty and ease, right, in their lives. But, like, how have you overcome those things and how have you stayed on track? The third thing, and this is a big one, is don't shoot yourself in the foot from the beginning. What do I mean by that? So often students come to me and they have questions about learning Arabic. And tied into their question is already a bullet in their foot when they're asking the question. How do I learn Arabic on my own? How do I learn Arabic for free? How do I learn Arabic without traveling to the Arab world, right? Like that within the question, they're already, they're already removing some of their chances of success in the question itself, right? And like, there's this kind of quadrant that I teach to my students about four things that you really need for mastery in Arabic. And that they can be applied to all kinds of things in your life, but what they are is, one of them is your talent. You need a certain amount of talent. You need a certain amount of, of, of intelligence to learn a new language, right? You need some hard work, right? You need to be willing to put in a certain amount of hours each week. You need a realistic timeline, okay? For some people, it is six months. For some people, I, I have some graduates who graduated recently from the Arabic in 60 Steps program. Shout out to Rashid and Wan. They finished the program in under four months, right? That, like, that's a really legit achievement, right? But some students take two or three years. So some students take 10. It is what it is. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and you give yourself the best chances if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're willing to take longer. And then the last one is support. For this one, for most people who are listening, this means money. This means how much money are you willing to put into it for most people, right? Some people do have access to ample resources, right? Like the children of Arabic teachers, for example, or the best friends of Arabic teachers, or people who live in an Arab country and have friends who speak English and can communicate concepts to them about learning Arabic, right? So like of those four things, okay, let me just recap them very quickly. So talent, hard work, timeline, and resources. Okay. So if you were to come to me and you're, you're, and you're going to say, I want to learn with no resources, like I want to learn without a speaking partner or, or for free, without buying any books, well, I'm going to say, well, look, you're going to have to be incredibly talented. You're going to have to put in a lot of hours every single week and it's going to take you a while. To, to, to compensate for that one handicap you're giving yourself. I don't think you can miss out on two of these things. If you came to me and you wanted to say, I want to learn for free and quickly, I don't think you'll have long enough in your life to learn Arabic. It changes the trajectory of your Arabic language progression from being something you can learn in a number of years in your life to being, okay, maybe if you live to be 600, maybe you'd learn Arabic. Maybe you'd learn Arabic with talent and weekly hours alone, with no resources and um, whatever the other thing was, no resources and... Um, and for free, right? Or and and without um, without hard work or something like, you know, maybe you could, but humans don't live long enough for it to be for it to be a model of a successful Arabic language progression, right? So so I recommend when students have their have their goal clear about why they want to learn. Let's say my goal is to speak really good Egyptian because I want to impress um, my husband's family. Let's say that for example, that's your goal. If you have a goal like that, why handicap yourself by saying I want to learn for free? Like, why handicap yourself by saying, I want to learn without speaking to my, my husband? I don't want to embarrass myself. Like, why handicap yourself by saying, I want to learn quickly? No, you have a goal. 
and let's achieve the goal. Whatever it takes, right? Like the other things, they've got to be secondary, right? If you've got a goal, because it, it's going to take some striving. It's going to take some sacrificing. It's going to take you needing to go out of your comfort zone a little bit. So I'd say don't shoot yourself in the foot from the very beginning of your journey, right? Be willing to have a goal and then by whatever means necessary, by whatever we need to do to achieve that goal. That would be my advice. Okay, get a structure. The fourth thing is to have a structure of some kind. Look, it doesn't need to be a degree program. It doesn't need to be enrolling on Arabic A-level here in the UK or GCSE, whatever. It doesn't need to be that. It doesn't need to be one of my programs, like a kind of online program. It doesn't have to be that, right? It can just be a book. If you want to get the Medina books, maybe you've got friends who have been successful through the Medina books. You've seen how successful um, people who graduate from the University of Medina are in their Arabic language speaking, like, and you like those books, do those books. But you need a structure of some kind for, for, for lots of reasons. Like the people who have put that together know so much more than you about learning Arabic. The people who have put that program together are people who have, have learned Arabic themselves. So they know about the kind of structure and the kind of order which you need concepts fed to you as you go. Right. So have a structure of some kind, whatever that is like that. in itself, you don't have to pay for that necessarily. That could be something free if you wanted. Right. Like but you need to have some kind of structure or else it's like. I mean, really, it's, it's the blind leading the blind in a way, not, not in a negative way, but like you are blind about how to learn Arabic before you've learned Arabic. You, you might have a bit more of an idea if you've learned another language before. You have a bit more of a chance. You do have a, you have some vision, right? But not not full vision like somebody who's done it before. Good. Then the next thing, this is like whatever your goals are for language learning. I'd say it's even beyond Arabic, but especially for a language as challenging as Arabic is little and often is more important than um, large amounts of time and infrequent. There's some organizations that teach Arabic online and they do like three and four hour seminars. That seems to work for them, but I don't know how, (laughs) quite frankly. Um, And and I know that there's lots of students who it doesn't work for, right? Like like obviously they, they may get results, but I know there's lots of students because I pick up the pieces afterwards quite often, right? And, um, so I advise little and often, you know, like if if there's a way of me practically doing it with my time and stuff, like I'd love to offer rather than one hour sessions, two half an hour sessions a week. It, w- it would be so difficult to, to organize it and to, you know, and because of the Internet and stuff, sometimes you end up logging on. If there's an issue, maybe you lose 10 minutes at one end of the lesson because of connection issues or whatever. And then by the time you get into it, if it was half an hour, it'd be a bit too difficult. But but that for self-study is ideal. Half an hour a day is way better than three and a half hours once a week. That's just how language acquisition works. So in order to achieve that, um, you'll need to have it in your routine somehow. There's something in the book on the power of habit by Charles Duhigg where he talks about actually joining a habit you want to develop into a habit you currently have in your life. So at the moment, if you're watching this, human beings being creatures of habit, undoubtedly you have habits in your life. No, No doubt you have habits in your life, whatever that is, right? Going to bed at a certain time, calling your mum at a certain time, putting your kids to bed at a certain time, getting up in the morning at a certain time, having coffee in the morning at a certain time, brushing your teeth at a certain time, whatever that is, right? Because you already have those habits in your life. Just join 15 or 20 minutes onto that habit. Like like an example for me, when I was learning Bangla, like for me, I I make coffee every morning. That's something I enjoy. I do it every morning. I wake up thinking about it, okay? So I just put my flashcards and my vocab for, and like my, my Arabic, um, my, my um, Bangla alphabet cards next to the kettle in the morning. So when I get up and I'm boiling the kettle, I know that I have those in front of me and I can do some revision for 10 minutes, whatever it is, right? I can annex habits that I want to develop onto habits that I already have in my life. So it's not like you need to pencil something else into your life and you have to disrupt what your current routine is. And that's something really powerful that you can use to develop new habits in your life. The next thing is to not believe in the hurdles. So so sometimes we set up hurdles as teachers for students. So let's say if a student wants to, um, if a student wants to speak, let's, let's keep with the example of speaking Egyptian Arabic to their husband. Okay, throughout your journey, speak Egyptian Arabic to your husband. You'll be bad at it in the beginning. Fine. He'll laugh at you. Fine. <laughs> like maybe even develop your relationship even more. Don't worry about it. If the th- if you want to learn Arabic, speak to your husband. Speak to your husband in Arabic from the beginning. Try out everything with your husband. But what people do so often, and the, the one that hurts me so much, when people do it with the Quran, when people are like, oh, I can't read the Quran because because I don't I haven't finished all of Arabic yet. Like 
if you want to learn the, if you want to learn Arabic for the Quran, you should be reading the Quran like along your journey. Like we sometimes put up these hurdles for ourselves, which end up becoming further and further away from us. People are like, I can't speak Egyptian Arabic with my husband yet because I'm not at a certain level yet where he won't laugh at me. You'll never get to that level without actually speaking to him in Arabic. That that's not like a goal that you get and you've achieved it. It's something you develop actually in the ecosystem of it. If you see what I mean. And like that, that's something that in my work now, what I believe in so much, I've, I've only really recently developed the language to articulate this belief so much, but I don't believe in hiding Arabic texts behind mountains of grammar and behind mountains of Arabic, uh, mountains of vocab lists and stuff like so, some, sometimes, sometimes we end up doing that to ourselves. We end up saying we need to learn all of this before we can access anything. Right. But OK, you, you, there are some things you might not be able to access from day one. I mean, look, you, you don't know everything day one. Be able to access some of it, right? You can you can at least access it. You might not have mastery over it, but, but you can access it, right? Like I, I don't believe in in having big hurdles in the way of our goal. I just believe in running through those hurdles at our goal, right? That's you know. I, I hope that makes sense to you guys. It, it really makes sense in my head and in, in, in my attitude towards approaching Arabic texts. Okay. Um, there's two more. So one of them, I had my graduation interviews with um, with Rashid and Juan actually recently, and I asked them what their advice would be for um, for future students on my program. And they both said the same thing. They both said develop a consistent routine for learning vocab. And it was also the same advice that I got from my supervisor when I was doing my degree in Arabic, because the vocab really it just goes on and on, and it can it can run away from you very quickly. Let's say in every lecture, like for us in our case, in every single lecture, excuse me, we would interact with like another 50 words. They'd give us another vocab list, another 50 words. Okay, 50 words in a day is a lot, but it's nowhere near as, enough, it's nowhere near as much as 150 words on the weekend when you have to catch up. It's nowhere near as much as, as 600 words at the end of the month if you've not caught up. Okay, like... The, the, the quickest way to learn the vocab is as you go, have a consistent routine from the beginning. And also you'll get stronger as well. Like any of you guys who have memorized vocab or even those of you who are memorizing the Quran, like in the beginning, okay, fair enough. Like, you know, in a week, maybe you're learning sort of ikhlas, another week, you know, sort of al-mesed, another week, sort of to nasr whatever. But when, you, when you've when you been in hivd for a little while, okay, like, Okay, we'll do three pages of Surat Muhammad today. We'll, we'll, we'll learn three pages today of Surat Al-Ahqaf. Like, you, you get better at it. You get better at acquiring this information. So developing a, a routine for it very early is really important. Two tools that they mentioned, one of them is Anki, and another one is uh, Quizlet as well. They're both, um, you know, revision and resources to make flashcards and stuff like that um, for them. So they both found that really useful. And I wanted to share that with you because... Um, that's what they said, and that they are living examples of successful students who have used those things and wish they had them earlier. Um, and they're things that I personally am not into. I used fl flashcards loads when I was at uni, like it was the thing that we all did when we were at uni. Like we all got our vocab lists out of our textbooks. We made vocab, we made vocab cards, flashcards, and I just don't like them. I, my brain needs tons of context with anything like that. Like I, I try to see a word at least six times in a, in six different contexts before I really remember it. So that's why I also just love jumping into texts really quickly as well, because you're just getting to see words in, in context, right? So, um, yeah, but, but anyway, just because that doesn't work for me, it doesn't mean I should starve the student body of, um, of, of, of knowing that and knowing that works for lots of other students. So using flashcards and specifically um, materials like, um, like Quizlet, uh, softwares rather, like Quizlet and um, Anki, there's apps for both of them. I think they're available, you know. On, on Apple and on and on the Android store. I don't know why they wouldn't be available on both, but good. So getting a good routine for, for, for vocab, um, whatever language you're le learning and whatever for, really, you should have a consistent routine for vocab. I mean, like, I mean, I think the average native speaker of an average language, you know, their active vocabulary is at least like 10,000 words. If you think how long is it going to take you to learn 10,000 words, like even if you learn 10 words a day, you wouldn't learn that many in a year, would you? If I'm like, that's, that'd be like 3,650 or whatever, right? My math is all over the place. That might be wrong, right? But like, yeah, if you learn 10 words a day, okay, you, to get to the stage, of, to, to the position of a native speaker, you'd still need like four years of learning 10 words a day. A consistent routine for learning vocab, for building the sheer amount of vocabulary you need is, um, is really important, okay? And then the last thing, number nine, okay? Don't take yourself too seriously. Look, here's the thing, right? Us adults, 
we feel anxious about stuff. I do, right? And even like a, a real box that I put myself in as a teacher is that people know me as an Arabic teacher now. So I find myself like when I chat in Arabic to like other dads at my son's school or like people at the madrasa or whatever, like I'm nervous I'm going to make a mistake in Arabic because they're like, oh, Allah mustaan. And the mudarris al al Arabiya. And the taqta. You make a mistake. <laughs> like, like you, you, you're making a khata, you know, like, you know, so I, I think like, oh man, I'm taking myself way too seriously, you know, but that really doesn't matter. Like even, even, you know, it really, really doesn't matter. You really shouldn't take it, take yourself too seriously with things like that because you will make mistakes. Everybody will make mistakes. And actually we're, we're always students. Like even the mudarris is a talib. Like even the student, even the teacher is a student. Like teachers should have teachers of their own and stuff too. And you know, you really shouldn't take yourself too seriously. And I, I think one of the biggest things to reflect on is, like, when we look at our children, they have such an advantage over us in learning languages, okay? We know that, right? We know that children, children obviously pick up languages really quickly, right? But why is that? Why really is that? Like, okay, they live in an environment where they're always hearing said language, right? But let's say you live in that environment as well. Say you're married into an Arab family and you move to an Arab country. Lots of people do that and they still don't learn Arabic. What's the difference? Well, children really don't have any inhibitions. Like, and in fact, like, in fact, they feel rewarded by speaking and making a mistake. They take the attention they get from making a mistake positively in them. But us adults, we get all too proud for that. You know, whereas really, like, we, we should not take ourselves too seriously. We should be a little bit more childlike and a bit more playful in our languages learning. Like that's, that, that's one of the biggest advantages, I think, that our children have over us. Of course, like, of course, another big example, like those, like loads of you are going to say, no, their brain is just younger and it's easier for them to learn. Of course that, right? And I'm not saying that that isn't true, but from what we can observe, one of the biggest advantages they have over us is they just don't care about getting stuff wrong. Like they're, they're not taking themselves too seriously. They're not like, you know, that's, that, that's, that's probably what I'd end by saying. So um, I think that's everything for this particular episode of the podcast. I think um, I think um, episode two of the Sam Martin Burr show will be on learning Arabic for free. So if there are students who do insist, they insist on having that restriction on themselves, despite me earlier in this episode um, saying that you shouldn't shoot yourself in the foot. If for some reason um, a student really doesn't want to spend a penny on the Arabic language learning studies, then I'm going to answer that question for you, inshallah. So in our next episode of the San Martin Burr Show, we'll be talking about how do I learn Arabic for free. So I'll see you guys in the next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.